It's Pat. It's a good, good size crowd. No, you. Well, um, thank you all for coming tonight. I am uh, very pleased and honored to uh, introduce Osvaldo Gutierrez, uh, Dr. and Professor Osvaldo Gutierrez, uh, who uh, I first met as a student here at Sacramento City College back in 2002, uh, and who I bumped into a, a few years ago at the Miller Symposium over at UC Davis. And then I was very fortunate enough to bump into him at Sac City College with his wife and daughter this summer. And immediately invited him uh, out to give a talk here. Uh, Professor Gutierrez uh, went from Sac City College down to UCLA where he got his bachelor's and master's degrees, I believe, and then came back to UC Davis for his PhD. Uh, then uh, earned her work as a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, and now is a professor in his third year at the University of Maryland College Park. Please give uh, Professor Gutierrez a warm welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction and for inviting me here. And I guess if you have any questions, we're done. You told me the whole story, right? <laughs> that was basically it. So. This is going to be a very informal talk. It's more going to be about my trajectory as, as a student and getting to the point where having some dreams of becoming a shepherd. So this is where some sheep here in Mexico to where I am right now. And feel free to interrupt me at any moment and, and ask any questions. So my life started here in, in Mexico. So here's Mexico City. Guanajuato is right next to it. It's about two hours. And at that time, my family is big, I mean, huge. Right? We have 14 brothers and sisters, and my mom and dad, and a lot of cousins and uncles and everything else. And growing up, I always wanted to be a shepherd. My grandpa was a shepherd. He had about 50 sheep, and I wanted to have 100. That was my goal, to have 100 sheep. That, that's what I always wanted. And we made a deal with my grandpa. So, well, every time the, the, the sheep give basically babies, right, I'm going to give you one. And then it's going to be, that's going to be on to you. So if that one gives you five or three or so on, then you're going to keep growing. So I figured, well, yes. By the time I'll be eight years old, I'm going to have a hundred sheep. Basic math, right? And that's when I knew the power of this as well. So. And at that time, the story why I have this shoe here is that that changed my life where I am. So that was my plan. My family, we all immigrated. Half the family immigrated to the United States. We couldn't afford immigrating the whole family, so then my dad returned. It was going to take the other second half. However, I supposed to stay with my grandpa to raise sheep. The whole family was going to leave. I was going to stay there to raise the sheep. That was the plan. And then the day before we left, my grandpa made something that changed my life. He went to the store to buy some shoes. He bought me a pair of shoes, and he bought my, my cousin another pair of shoes. The problem, though, is that he bought my favorite type of shoes, and it was uh, basically like $10 shoes. And he bought my cousin like a $50 shoe. My dad was pissed. My dad was really pissed. So then he's like, no, you're going with us tomorrow. And that changed, so cross that one out. <laughs> so then I was going to, we got in the bus, and I never questioned my dad. And I, at that moment, I was thinking, I guess I'm going to the United States. And what do you do in the United States? You would chase your dreams. You have to have some kind of dreams. And at that moment, I decided, well, if I'm going to go chase my dreams, what is my dream? I'm like, I think I want to be a doctor. And that was it. That's how I wanted to become a medical doctor. For no other reason. I just wanted to become a doctor. It's going to become important later on. So then, here I am. This, this is what I wanted to be. I envisioned myself like this. I have this skin color, right? <laughs> and yeah, so I was like, sounds good. This will be my... my that would be me at some point. That was me actually there, so they kind of look alike. <laughs> but the, the take home message of this slide is that you gotta have, it's okay to have goals, but be okay with change. They're always gonna be changing your goals, right? Whatever you think you have right now, as long as it's a goal, and as long as you treasure the goal, it's okay. Because again, be okay with change. Some things, life is gonna play around with you, life is gonna take you one direction or another. But be okay with change. Don't, don't get mad at the change. Early life was, so when we moved to Sacramento, we moved to Oak Park, right? And if you read everything, you believe everything that is on Wikipedia, this is uh, directly from Wikipedia. It says that in the 80s and 90s, we came in 1993, basically there was a lot of drug activities, gang violence, that was the environment that we grew up. 
I mean, now that I think about it, it was a huge family. We're like 14 plus uncles and cousins. Where are you going to find a place, a house that's going to rent something for 20 people? They always ask in the application how many people are going to live in the house, and it's hard to convince somebody to let you rent something for 20 people. Right? So the only place is, is really Oak Park, which was friendly to us. They're like, yeah, we we'll have a place for you in Oak Park. So we set up in Oak Park. And this is, us. this is one of the few pictures where we all look kind of fancy and friends. So at this moment, my uncle wanted to take us together. Basically, take everybody a picture. So we can send it to Mexico and say, boy, we're living it up. And look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we're, we're living it up at this moment. Right? We see a lot of people here, a lot of my sisters. Some of them are here with presents. So that's, that's really nice for us. And here I am, right? They're kind of smiling. <laughs> and I have this because Oak Park is recognized by this market, Oak Park market. So there's a lot of anything that you want, you can find in Oak Park. You name it, right? Usually drugs. <laughs> you can find clothes and everything else. You can, if you want a stereo, for sure they'll get you a stereo. <laughs> or you'll go and say, you know what, I need, I need this kinds of shoes on. I'll be right back. And then they'll get you the shoes. They'll get you the shoes for the right amount of money. And here's Tupac. So I like this quote because through everything that you're going through, right? You have to have a sense of humor. You also have to smile. Don't let it drag into you. I mean, life can get hectic. I can, life can get you down, and you want to give up on your goals. But basically, just, just be positive, right? So make the best out of every situation. I mean, a lot of my friends, they got sucked into the old park. A lot of them got killed. A lot of them went to prison. But it, 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 stay focused. It's one of my messages. And, and make the best out of the situation. I learned a lot from Oak Park. I learned a lot by dealing with people that were in the streets. By how do you treat people that want to hurt you or different, even how to do the way you dress. I learned really fast that you couldn't dress certain colors, green, red, blue. They were off the table, so I stay neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Only the babies could afford wearing red. <laughs> and after a certain age, you couldn't afford wearing those colors. Now it's not the same, but at that moment, it was very important that you should know not to wear certain things. And, it's a dress code, right? <laughs> you can still apply those things now. <laughs> so early life, uh, I think a lot of people get the notion that just because I'm a professor, I was got my PhD, that I, I was smart all the time, but I was not as smart all the time. So if you look at this, this was the Stanford test that they give to medical students and elementary things. And I was pretty average. I mean, I spent out in, in the, I was average in math and everything else was kind of low compared to that national. So there was nothing that's spectacular. And here, what I want to mention is that there's always room for improvement. So I saw this, and this pushed me hard. I, for some reason, I work hard when, when I fail. And when I see low scores, that drives me to do better. I think if this were being 90s, I'll probably be giving up and try something else. I need to be challenged. That was my mentality. And here I am studying. I was one of those kids that, for Christmas, all you wanted was a dictionary. Because it was thick, and it was going to keep me busy for a long time. That was the only reason why I liked something like that. And along the way, what I always found out is that I was really blessed with having a lot of great mentors. I could think of every single mentor. And here's two that I want to, I want to highlight. This is my high school teacher. And this is, at that moment, Emma Godina was in charge of all, again, violence reduction program at this school, basically trying to keep at-risk students away from gangs. And she really basically made me believe that I could still achieve the American dream. No. Here's my mom and this is me. Again, here I keep it neutral, right? Red and blue. There was, there was no confusion there. <laughs> so, during this time though, I, I found something. And this is why I want to bring those two, those two teachers. When I got into high school, I was getting all A's for the first year. I was a straight A student. The second year I got a straight A's. So I was on my way to becoming a, a doctor. That's how I envisioned. So I thought, well, I think now I've been reading some books and it's that time that you go to the counselor and start talking about college. And it was very unfortunate because then I went to the counselor for the first time. We wanted to discuss about college. And she said, well, yeah, there's, uh, there's other colleges. Well, dude, what about the social security number? I'm not sure why she even asked that, that kind of question. I was like, I don't have a social security number. Do I need one? And that's when it really hit me that being a document was going to be a problem. That was going to be a problem, man. 
It was something that I needed to improve. Right? And at that moment, I gave up. I gave up once on school. So my grades tanked. I had F's, D's. I think the third year, if you look at my transcript, it was like a 1.2 GPA. Chemistry was an F. Physics was a D. And I just kind of gave up on that moment. But these mentors, they made me believe that there might be another opportunity. They made me believe that. They made me dream again. And so I started working. So I gave up on, on studying, but at the same time, I like to learn. So I always went to school not to get a degree, but to learn. And that's, that's a key difference. I went to school because I wanted to learn, so I still continue when I took calculus in high school. And I got on my ass. I got these, and the teacher was like, well, Father, you're smart, you should do your homework. I was like, honestly, I have no time to do homework. Have a, I work 40 hours at night, so at 4 o'clock I work in construction, and uh, in some parts in construction, I work in a bakery, and I had no time to do, to do homework. I got up at 3 in the morning, and three hours later I had to go to school. I was like, there's no way I'm going to spend two hours doing homework. There's no way. So I started working. I like this one. I'm a heavy, I like sports, and I always look for inspiration in, in quotes. And here's this one. This is a coach from Villanova. It's just, don't give up. Don't ever give up. And during this work, I started working at, at this one, the Lewis Family Partnership. That was really a fancy name for Oak Park Market. <laughs> That's all it is. And uh, I apologize, hopefully this is nobody's social security number, but you can see the devil man. <laughs> so you go to one job, six months after, you're gonna get fired a year after if you're lucky. So move on and then change it a little bit. Don't, don't change it. I mean, it costs a lot of money to get a new social security. <laughs> so, but I used to be different one. Uh, I'll get by. But at that moment, I got a second opportunity. My sister convinced me and somehow managed me to get into City College. So I thought, I'm in college now. I graduated, I'm in college, there's a new opportunity. I'm right on track again to become a doctor. I'm right on track. I had to make some ground, so I had to start from scratch. So even though I was in calculus, I decided to go back to the algebra. Because I was like, I need to relearn everything. I need to retool and then st start studying again. And this is a professor when we started this. <laughs> professor Bill, right? And if you notice, he taught this class and I got a C. <laughs> it was a hard class. <laughs> it's a very hard class. <laughs> but I learned a lot from, from this class. I needed to be challenged. And that was, my, I, I can say this was my last C I ever got. It taught me a lot of hard work because I woke okay, If I really want to be ready to go to the next level, I need challenging courses. I don't care about the grades. I need to be challenged. And this was a really challenging class that made me push to get my C. But then I knew then that I was going to be well prepared for any, all the other ones. It was a hard work ethic one that I really liked. I hear here's calculus, I get another C. So I was not that great in school. Right? But I was preparing myself as slowly to become a really good student. And after that, I got boys and bees. I think boys after a certain point. But I learned, again, along that time, I found another mentor. This is Bob Houston. He was at the Metro. So this is a coffee shop that I usually go to Sacramento City College. This is my Bible here. It was organic chemistry book. <laughs> I read it, that thing like 20 times. And even before classes started, because I really, I found finally something that really I was really passionate about. And where I can make a living. I mean, I, I read it because then I found a lot of flyers where people needed help in tutoring. So I started as a gold mine. I was like, yes, if I learn this, I can make money. And I make this pay for my everything, everything. Or even, I was making $2,000 a week at UCLA from learning this Bible here. Okay? A lot of people needed help in this class. For some of the reason, it was very challenging. For me, it was really fun drawing. I always liked drawing. So I guess here the take home message is that grades, that's why I never really judge anything by its cover. When somebody sends me a CV, they want a research opportunity. I ignore the transcript, it's like, because they don't tell the whole story. You really have to meet the person. They really don't tell the story. The whole story. You see this, you see my transcript. If my daughter got me this report card and in her previous grade in chemistry, I'd be like, stay away from chemistry. You're really bad at chemistry, so focus on things when you're getting A's. But for me, it's like, no, I found my passion. Actually, that C is means something else. It means that I can compete. Maybe that's what the C is for. Okay? <laughs> so for me, it was challenging, but it, it 
It doesn't tell the whole story just a simple story at all. From then on, I said I, I, was, I became really good at what I think I studied was dedication. I just spent, I was at the coffee shop from 6 in the morning. I left to 11 o'clock. And, and then I worked after, or I worked in the weekend and so on. And during this time, before I even transferred, so here's a letter from UCLA. I still remember this day, so it's April 2006. And I got admitted to UCLA. I got, I tried various different times, and finally, this one, I had an extra, I think at that time it was like $58, so I decided to apply. I, was, I already got accepted to UCLA, where I was thinking, whoa, I have $50, I could apply to one other school. What's another school that you want to apply to? Today? For some reason, UCLA sounds nice. They have a very, very basketball team, football team. <laughs> I like UCLA. But then during that time, I was also on my way to becoming a doctor. Right? That was my main goal. I took the MCAT before even transferring. Because, and this is the one that highlights why I treasure Sac City, Sacramento City College, and Community College in general. That's the best education you can get. That's the best education by far that you can get in city colleges. Through all the schools that I've been through, that's where I see really passionate teachers that really care. That's when they're willing to give you the time. And that's really what they care about their students. A lot of times in the larger classrooms, you have 500 students. There's no way you, connect, you, you can dedicate that, uh, that amount of time. So this one, at 29 is not bad. I mean, look at the social security number, 999, that looks fake already, right? <laughs> but here, the, I got a 29, and this is the average for that year. So I was here, so the average was there. I was above the average, like, I think I can get into medical school. <laughs> And the reason why I accepted the offer at UCLA is because I went there with my friend. And this professor, uh, Garcia Garibé, is a, is a Mexican professor that he told me, if you come here, and if you get all A's, I guarantee you a spot at the medical school. I was like, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll get the grades. I'll get the grades. And I said, but you still need to do research. because You have that community service. I already volunteer at the hospitals. I got the grades. I got the MCAT. You need the research. I was like, well, I gotta get the other one. So during this time, I started emailing every single professor in the chemistry department at UCLA. I was like, your research is, is great. I read all the papers about it. Of course, it was all lying, right? <laughs> like, you're an amazing professor. I heard great things about you. Nobody responded except one, <laughs> this guy. His name is Ken Howe, and at that moment, I didn't know, but he's always been nominated for the Nobel Prize. Yeah. It is like the biggest thing in organic chemistry for computation. He established a whole field in that area. So he's huge. And look at this. I found this picture today that it says even UCLA. So when I was 12 years old, it was already predicted I was going to go to UCLA. <laughs> this professor, I want to highlight this one. Treat everyone with respect and dignity. Every single person. During that time, I was in this big group. This is only half of this group. That group was like 50 professors. And all these that are highlighted, they're all professors now in research universities. During that time, I was the only undergraduate. But they treat me with respect, they treat me as far as the team. And now I see everybody, all oh, this one's here, especially this guy that is so big and so big in the field that I still remember some of the stories where I emailed him, I was like, how, Ken, I call him Ken, he's like, Ken, can I, can I see you for, I'm having a hard time understanding this concept. And in the research that we're doing, I have a hard time with this one. Can I see you this week? He's like, yeah, it's come Sunday. He's like, Sunday, Sunday is this good for me. And nobody showed up Sundays, but I showed up, and he would spend like seven hours with me. And I thought that was normal, but that was not normal. That's really not normal. No research professor in this caliber this big is going to spend that many hours with you. But he was willing to take the time. I mean, he would, after the gym, he would come there, and he would just go one by one every single problem. And he invested a lot of, a lot of time with me, and I thought that was normal. But then I talked to my other professor, and he's like, no, he never spent any time with me. Not even with his post-ops or graduate students. So it was very rare that he decided to invest time in you. And I opened up for him. So there's the other line. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I opened up a lot to this professor. So this is the first time that I was very open to a professor that I told him, I'm a document. I, at UCLA, the first professor that I met when I told him that I was undocumented, he basically kicked me out. We never talked to him. And I was afraid that I didn't know how they were going to respond, especially somebody that, is, that that letter of recommendation depends so much. So I was really afraid of, of opening up to Ken Howe. I finally did, and I think even then he decided to invest even more time. So instead of pushing me away, he brought me close. When I was homeless at UCLA, right? Right? I, 
love research because it was a home, so I could sleep in my office. Right? And I was very fortunate for that. The people saw me in the office sleeping, and they thought, like, this guy's studying a lot. But no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he was very impressed by that. He thought I was, I was spending a lot of time working in the lab. But no, in reality, I needed a place to sleep. All my money went to be paid for, for college. And, but if it wasn't for people like him that are there to devote their time, their effort, I wouldn't be here with where I am. During this time, after group meeting, he came to me and he's like, Hold on, hold on, you stay. So everybody left. So every Tuesday, we had group meeting for about four hours, five hours. Everybody left and he's like, Man, I'm really impressed by you. I mean, you've been doing all this work, you're publishing, you're getting all this. Like, so what do you want to do? He's like, Oh, doctor. He's like, I finally got the letter. I finally convinced him. I didn't want to tell him that I want to become a doctor because I first wanted him to see my hard work ethic, and then I'm trying to tell him, oh, well, let me tell you all my plans. My plans to become a doctor, write me a great letter, and get me to medical school, and I'll say. It was kind of funny, but the next day that that happened, he got a brain aneurysm. He was found in a pool. But also, at that moment, we got an email, and then the person that was swimming with him, well, he was a neurosurgeon at the UCLA Medical Center. He grabbed him, half hour, he was already operating on him. He saved his life. If he wasn't there, he would have died. They said that brain hours. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk for the longest time. But even after six, after six weeks, he was already in the lab. He couldn't move. It was really weird seeing absolutely <laughs> very energetic. He was basically walking and he would kind of mumble. But he, he wanted to be there in the group meetings and he wanted to listen to your research. And he was still typing your letters for recommendation because they knew they were that important for you, that you need them to get to the next level. They will be typing one word at a time. And that was really hard to see, but it also made me realize that there's a lot of people that are, they want to, they want to work hard for you. Not for them, he already has the prestige, he has the money, he has everything, but for other people. And that was very inspiring for me to see that. If I was him, I would have probably went to Hawaii and kind of relaxed for a year, right? But no, he wanted to be in the lab right away, as soon as possible. So, this one is, you see Davis, new challenges, familiar environments of him. Why do I say that? During this time, I applied to all the medical schools and none of them got in. I called somebody at Stanford, I was like, your application is not, it's not even it's a minimum application. What's going on? I was like, well, you need a social security number. I was like, well, I don't have one. I, mean, I could lie, but I really don't have one. I was like, well, you need to have support enough, you need to show your bank account that you have enough money to pay for the medical school. That's not going to happen. But I think if I take it one semester at a time, I can pay. I pay for you, so, like, so, so why not? I was like, no, you're not, you're not allowed to apply. So that changed my, my dreams. My career becoming a doctor, it based out of that point. Right? And I was about to give up. I didn't wait for a whole week. And then, at that moment, Hope was still there in the office all the time. And it made me realize, I went to a period, I guess, like dark, dark periods that everybody goes through, I'm thinking, so why exactly did I want to become a doctor? When did I decide that I wanted to become a doctor? So when I went back and I was thinking, it was when I left Mexico on that bus, I wanted to achieve my American dream. And I always thought the American dream was becoming a doctor. I was like, well, I could become a doctor doing something else, something I really like. I love doing research. So why not continue that dream, something that you really like, and keep doing that? I like mentoring people, so why not continue that? Why not make that a living? Why does it have to be a medical doctor? I hated the hospitals. I mean, I went there, and it's kind of fun, but it's, it's not as much as the lab. Definitely not as much. So that's when I decided to pursue something else. And I want to highlight this one again, don't be afraid to help, because I got denied from all graduate school. And Hal was questioning that. He's like, I can't believe that you got denied, because basically you're on your grades, your trajectory, my letter, in particular my letter, <laughs> how come you're not, you're the first undergraduate in my group that's not getting accepted to a graduate school? There's something weird here, so I'm like, tell me. It's like, there's nothing, I don't know. <laughs> nothing weird, well, did you fail the, the GRE? No, I thought that it was pretty okay with GRE. It's like, well, let's look at your application. 
and I got classified as an international student. And he's like, oh, never mind, you're, you're not going to get admitted anymore. Because we're, you're fighting for those two or three spots as an international student. There, there's no way. I mean, you're competing with all China, Japan, Europe for those three spots in those schools. And you're applying to the Stanford, to the Berkeley, to the, I mean, Berkeley is the top program in the world for chemistry, right? So it's like, do you know that you're not going to make it? It's like, but you should have told me before. I was like, what, what does that even mean? I was like, I could be just calling you. I was like, oh. He's that type of person that he is walking up to everywhere. All we have to do is call. It's like, are you serious? Like, yeah, I mean, the Stanford is a private school, so they wouldn't pay for you and they give you a stipend. So, so what are the leftover schools that they have a rejectors? Like, Davis hey, hasn't said anything. It's like, and he gets grab the phone, Google something up on the internet, and he calls like, hey, this is how I want you to get us all this application and look at it. The next day, I get this guy to show up. So you see, he's like, you've been admitted to the chemistry program, the PhD. I'm like, what? And how? He's smoking a cigarette. Like, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> he knows he's he's full light. He's so he's, he's powerful, and a lot of people own favors. Right? So he's almost like a gangster that you see in the farm. <laughs> and so he stops smoking, but this I, I like this thing. But then. It, Dean Tintilla, though, eventually my advisor that I went to work for at UCLA, at UC Davis, he worked for Ken Howe. So he showed up, he's like, okay, you got a job. So I went and worked for, for Dean Tintilla. And I want to highlight this one because it's new challenges in familiar environments. Usually people say, oh, you're going to face a lot of challenges when you go to unfamiliar territories. So like, no, I actually think there's even more challenges when you go back to familiar environments. Now the expectations were really high. People thought, like, you graduated from UCLA, you got a master's, you're supposed to be making money, you're, you're in a PhD program, what's going on? How come you still look like something, right? I wasn't dressed like this, I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> so then, I started working, I was dishwashing at a frequent morning grab. I was doing my PhDs during the day and night. The good thing is that Dean gave me an office where I have access throughout the whole time. But I was dish, dishwashing. And then I move up the ladder, so I become a surfer and a buster. But I was doing that and eventually started to take this toll. People showed up at the restaurant and they would be like, you should really consider going back to school. I was like, I'm already in school. <laughs> <laughs> but the people judge you for how, where they work, where you even work. They judge you for that, the way you look and, and where you're working. I bet if I was, was working in an office or something, they would have never said you should go back to school. Just the fact that I was dishwashing, they assumed that I was in school. They assumed that I was not in a PhD program. And I was in a PhD program. So they even in Old Park, I was thinking, well, maybe I could go back to Old Park and, and go work there. And I never lost those, those connections. I worked here before, and I always called and said, hey, I need a job again. And they'll always hire me. I could call Old Park again, and they'll probably hire me again. <laughs> so I never lost those connections. But then in this familiar environment, that's when things get really hard to take in this talk, thinking, man, I'm going to be 30 years old. I'm not going anywhere. What am I going to do with a PhD if you're a doctor? Right? And my dad was saying, you go to Mexico. If you already got a degree from UCLA, go to Mexico and they'll hire you. And there's, in the town that we live, there's a pennant, which is basically a petroleum, so you work as an engineer or something like that. It's like, go there. And how was saying, oh, I can make you a professor at UNAM, at the biggest, biggest university in Mexico. Like, what are you talking about? You want me to call? I was like, I can call. I was like, oh, don't call. I'm not ready to go to Mexico. <laughs> so I, you have to be careful with when, when you say too much, right? <laughs> so then I don't want to make you how to worry about it. And I always feel that I can call, but only for a certain thing when it's an emergency. But it was really taking this whole thing and documenting it. So I went and talked to Dean. I was like, you know what, Dean? I, I need to graduate. So what is, what is required to graduate? And then I'll favor my life out afterwards. So I was like, well, we published the average year that the, we published at UC Davis in my group is six papers. Okay? So publish six papers, write your thesis, and you'll be good. So I was working really hard while, <coughs> during this time, I was, I was using all my money not to support myself, but to pay for school. I was paying for graduate school. They're supposed to pay you $30,000 per year to go to graduate school, plus medical. I was doing the other way. I was paying them $30,000. And then that, and just seeing everybody else, it was really, I felt that it was really unfair where 
a lot of other students, they left at 5 o'clock when I had to go there at 5 o'clock to you. And I was paying for all that. So I was, I'll tell my friends, why are you leaving? Well, it's already 5 o'clock. It's happy hour. Oh, I was like, man, and you're getting paid to do this? And I'm paying on dishwashing to come back and be in the lab? So it was just really hard on me. And my dad and, and my mom, I mean, that family, I, I really want to start doing something. And at that moment, what happened is that in June, Barack Obama passed an executive order. I was like, he's smiling right now. That day, he was jumping around. He's big, but he was super smiling when they passed. A DACA that I could get a work permit, a social security. And that day, I knew I could graduate. So the next day, I told Dean, I'm graduating. He's like, oh, yeah, I have 12 papers, not six. I have 12. And you say the thesis, well, here's the thesis. I said, like, what do you mean you've been planning this? I was even planning it this day since I can remember. So I was ready to graduate. He's like, oh, just find a postdoc. And after you find a postdoc, then I'll sign. I went to the coffee shop, and I started looking at papers. I like, who do I want to work for? It's like, and I saw a paper by her, Marissa Kozlovsky. I was like, this is what I said in her email? Right away, within a minute, she responded. Send me your letters of recommendation. I told him, I think I found someone. Like, what are you talking about? I just told him to start looking. He's like, well, I think I found it this one here, and they send the letters, I call Hal to send the letters, and then she said, hey, I gotta talk to you. I said, but I can't say the things I'm gonna say on email. I was like, well, that sounds kind of fishy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I still remember, I went to visit Berkeley at that moment, I was outside the library, and she's like, as long as it's this off the record, whenever a conversation starts like that, it's, it's really off the record. <laughs> and she said, well, you, you don't have your work permit, right? I was like, no, not yet, but I'm going to apply it, so I should get it in three months. I'm, you know what? I don't care. I want you here. I don't care if you have your papers. I don't care if you're undocumented. I don't care. I need you to start working for me now. So what do I need to do to, for you to get you here? And I was like, I need that type of person. That's the person that I want to work for. Somebody that is willing to go beyond the requirements, the, right? To go beyond the, the duty of to get you where you want to be. And I did research, I think it was, that was my end. I, I tend to look for signs. So I said, if someone respond is a sign that I, that's where I should belong. But I, I should have research. Because she was well known at Penn that all the postdocs never paid, made it past the first year. So they all, they all got fired after the first year. When I got there, it was like, well, here comes the other one. It's, it's going to be gone in eight months. <laughs> so I didn't know, but she was very tough. She's one of those persons that she hardly ever smiles. You're never going to see her smile. She's very intimidating. But she's a really, really good person. And she's willing to go down the best for a mile for you. And during that time, I started working. And then three months later, I said, you know what? I need to go to Mexico. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, this is my opportunity. So I can't be lingering this whole work permit in that kind of right? So I apply and gather a whole stack of this much papers of letters of recommendation. Everybody that I knew, I asked him for a letter and the paperwork that I needed to go to Mexico so I could come back illegally. And my family, you're crazy. You're undocumented still. Don't forget that. How, can, how are you going to go to Mexico and then come back illegally? Like, well, there's this program here that if you ask for a parole, you might get lit. And a lot of the people in the news were saying, no, don't, don't go there because then they might trick you. They just want you out and you're not going to be able to make it back. And I know some people never made it back. But for me, it was like, my grandpa was already close to 100 years old, and I wanted to see my grandpa. That was one of the promises when I left the bus that I, I was going to return to Mexico as a doctor. And I was a doctor. I had my PhD. I was thinking, this is the right moment. This is a sign. And this thing it exists at that moment because it's a sign. So I told my family, I said, well, if they give me the, the pro, I'll go. If not, then I won't go. They approved the pro. They approved it for three months. So then at that moment, to my family, I'm going to go, it's like, no, you, you already have your job, you're getting paid, you're finally doing all this, and you're going to go and risk it all for nothing. I was like, yeah, I think this thing will be worth it. So I packed everything, I went to Mexico, and I said, I want to chase my dreams, I want to continue chasing my dreams. I, for the first time in my life, I felt how it was to not having to worry about being undocumented. I don't want to worry about that anymore. But right. during this time, also what happened is that my work permit is fired. What was it And she, we didn't have any grants, so she put me to teaching. 
So for a while, I was teaching as an undocumented at the pen. And I saw a lot of the Ivy League students that went there, and they all wanted to go to medical school. I still write a lot of letters from them. They all send me emails, say, oh, I'm in medical school, and so on. For six months, I was undocumented. And I told the professor, I was like, you know what? I, I don't think I should be doing this. Like, you think too much. Get in there and teach. They don't care. The students will not ask you if you're undocumented or not. And it's true. You don't ask anybody, your professor, hey, are you documented or not? <laughs> That's the one thing you should never ask, right? Don't ask your teachers that, or else you're going to get an F. <laughs> Nobody asked me that. And I was like, I'm going to continue my journey. I'm not. Okay, if you say that I could do that, it's like, yeah, you have too much faith in the system. Nobody's checking those paperwork. <laughs> I was like, oh, fine. And I think she just wanted to get me to focus on research. That does her way. But I went to Mexico and then I saw my grandpa. And that was my, my goal. I always dream about the moment I was going to go see my grandpa again. It was kind of unfortunate. He recognized me. He's like, you're the, because his memory was almost gone. He's like, hey, I know you. You're the one that threw all my sheep into the river. <laughs> I was like, why? I just pissed at you on that day. But he still remembered me for that because I, I got really mad and had a bad temper, so I threw all the sheep out wanted to kill them all, right? <laughs> I just dumped them back to the river. And some, I think some of them died because he remembered me for that. <laughs> but I was really mad at him for, for some reason. But he's like, I still remember you. You threw the sheep all into the river. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget about the sheep. I'm a family. Be care about his sheep. <laughs> But then coming back from that, so I made it, I made it to this work permit, and then I got into the airplane, and I was in the immigration line, and they're like, you're citizens, permanent residents, and other, and they're like, hey, you, you gotta go into the office, I'm like, oh, man. And they kept me there for five minutes by myself in one this little small office. During the, this time, everything just went all over my head, I was like, I know what's gonna happen, I'm gonna call. And my dad's gonna say, I told you, I told you we're not gonna let you go. How can you be so dumb? I mean, you don't require a PhD to do that. They will be I can just imagine everybody telling me that. We tell them that. Man, how can you be so stupid to go there and fall for this, right? But then four immigration officers came and was like, oh, great. Not four. I mean, it usually it takes two, two. So I was like, to walk in. I was like, it's okay, you're gonna be okay, right? So then here comes the team of four. I was like, man. And they all came and was like, congratulations, this is your past. And you're never going to be undocumented again. And that changed everything. That was it. It's that we need more people of you. It's that, but this save this paper. Because it's your entry to become a citizen, to become a permanent resident. And now I'm glad that I am. But that was really that main point. Things like how easy it was for, I suffered for so long for just a little piece of paper. And how many students are, how many people never risked it? I know a lot of people, a lot of family members, a lot of cousins, a lot of friends that are not willing to take that chance to go back and do this. They're afraid that you might not come back. And I can understand that. At that moment, I was kind of crazy. I just went from a gut feeling. Wow, it's not that I recommend doing this. But for me, it's, it saved me, helped me, because I had this little guy. And this little guy is well connected everywhere around the world. <laughs> so, that moment, Here's my mom, she passed away during the process of once I, I got into Maryland and I took the contract. And I want to tell more of the positive things here of what happened that day. So the way that it works is that for training of professors is you get your bachelor's, you go do a PhD, or do an extended postdoc. Like a postdoc is more training to becoming a, a faculty. In reality, there's no need to do a postdoc unless you want a really high-end position in, in industry or you haven't found your job right after, or you want to become a professor, then it's required to do a full stop position. So it's like a competition, and during that time I applied to different schools. I didn't get any offers my first try. The second time I got interviewed five places, and three places offered me jobs. And I was very fortunate because during that year, they really only take like three or four professors in research universities in organic chemistry. There's not a lot of positions there. I mean, it's not guaranteed that it might be another position next year, so they're really rare. But I was fortunate, and I couldn't believe it, the, the whole process of how we worked with this one. So that, that was kind of a uh, nice thing with it. So my advisor, this one says, okay, get ready. It feels good when you're loved, right? Like, yeah, it does feel good when you're loved. So they took me there. My sister is here. I took my wife, my daughter, and they're like, I'm going to take you everywhere. I was like, really? 
we're going to give you a down payment for the house. And I was like, what about tuition with my wife? You want that? I said, yeah. Said, okay, we include the tuition too. Hmm, what more can I get? <laughs> <laughs> What about tuition for my kids? I got that too. That's comes with it. Why else can we get that? <laughs> I, was, I was trying to give more, and this is a big contract that you sign. As long as you're not greedy, I was thinking, you know, I really need a super computer. It's like, what's bother? Why would you need a super computer? Like, as long as you're able to justify it, I need a super computer because sometimes you don't want to depend on a small computer. If it breaks, I need to continue doing my racer. It's like, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> so they gave me another hundred thousand dollars for another super computer. It's like. I think I need more. <laughs> and I pushed for more. I pushed for another 100000 I was like, you know what? I need more money for chemicals because then what if you ran out the first year? It's a lot of trial and error. I mean, I came from Penn. As soon as I prepared, so I tried to convince him, right? I, I was trying to be logical. I was like, I think we need more money for chemicals. They just raised that thing for 300000 They gave me more than they, they first offered him. And I was thinking, can we push it for more? And my wife's like, don't do that. <laughs> so, no, we, don't, we don't want to lose this opportunity anymore. It's like, okay, fine, let, let's sign it, right? So we signed the contract, and that was really nice. And during that time, my mom was alive. She, she passed away on my first, when I first started. And as you first start as a system professor, you, you want to get the, the ground going, right? You, you have to teach, you have to recruit students. And then you have a death of a family that, that really affects you. Everything kind of shut down. I have a great mentors that some of the professors they told me, like, you know, I know you feel the pressure to get going with your program, but you can go and cover your class. They didn't cover the class, but it was nice to feel that they really wanted you. They, they wanted you to succeed. So take some time off if you want. Take a year off. Don't worry. You can't wait to stand your contract this thing to another year, another two years if you want your tenure. It's like, I don't need that. But it feels nice to have that support, that kind of environment. And this is me right now. This is what I started. I want to tell this story about this guy here, Wes Lee, because he reminds me of me. He was lingering for the department. His dad got a PhD, and he was at the department. He was already there for three years, and nobody wanted him. The department wanted him to get rid of him, so they basically did everything to take him out to the point where, like, I don't want you in my lab, in my research group. I don't want you, I don't want you. So he was TAing for a long time and just trying to find a home and nobody wanted him. He came to me and he sent me an email and said, oh, I read your research, you're the greatest thing. And I'm like, I started to wait a minute, I heard this before. That was me. I, was like, I read all your papers, you're doing amazing. Wait a minute. Do you copy my emails? So I decided, like, okay, if you're willing to, I'm going to get there in the summer. If you're willing to work, the hours that I'm going to be there. And if you want to take my class and pass my class for an A, then yeah. And he did all that work. And he was setting up the whole lab by himself and this other postdoc. This is my post first postdoctoral student. Now my group has grown. That's one of the things I really like about my research, that you can mentor a lot of students. So I have a lot of students here that this is a high school student, some undergraduates, some at Gordon Medical School, some from community college, another one from, from a small school. So, you can recruit a lot of students, you can mentor a lot of people, and that's something that I really like, so this is my, my American dream, in that sense. Here, there's a more recent picture. Here, the undergraduate students, the Saturday undergraduates, for as much as you want, very few show up on a Saturday afternoon to do research. So the other 10 undergraduates doing the research, they're not here, they're not picture. But this is one of the things that I really like about, about what we do. And what exactly is, is what we do? So it's briefly what we're trying to tackle is that, we're trying to tackle this problem of making drugs. This is FDA. FDA approved drug. If you see how much, how expensive they are, going through this process with my mom, you start finding out she has breast cancer, stage four. You start realizing how fortunate you are for having medical insurance, for having a company to help you out. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to pay for any of this. If you don't have insurance, then they'll burn to all your savings and even more. And we try to tackle this problem. We have five to 10,000 compounds get screened, basically. They make it through the first round of, this might be a, a potential drug, right? And the only one is going to make it. If we were able to cut this one by a thousand times, even a hundred times full, so if this costs 10 billion, my logic is only one billion, then everything should become cheaper. Or, or companies will get more creative, one or the other. Well, we think that. 
it'll become cheaper, the whole thing expires, the, the patent, and then people can afford medicine. So this is the problem that we're trying to tackle in our institute. We're trying to make this thing very affordable. To make this compound, by far, the number one method to make this compound, they use palladium chemistry. Palladium, they use it as a transition metal, like as a catalyst, to make carbon-carbon bonds or carbon-nitrogen bonds. And those are the ones that you guys see in every single drug. Just look at the compound, you see carbon-nitrogen, carbon-oxygen bond. And likely the process to make that, they needed palladium to do that at this stage. Right? And look at this price. Palladium, $30,000 <coughs> for one kilogram. Iron, three hundred dollars. Right. So if we're able to use instead of using flavoring, we use something that is super, super cheap, like iron. Then we hit the jackpot. We can make this thing more affordable for people to afford those medicines. And the reason why it's so cheap is because iron is very abundant in the earth. It's very easy to extract. I mean, you go outside and there's iron rust. You can even lick iron, and you're not gonna get. So you're not gonna die from the iron, right? Because your body uses iron. Your body doesn't use palladium. It's very toxic. But iron, you can really get, you can eat it. You can eat it. Sometimes they even recommend to eat iron, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can use that as a catalyst to make this drug, then we can make all this whole process affordable. And that's what we do at the University of Maryland. We try to make that that process affordable. And that end, I want to go more into the fun things that, that I do. One thing that I really love doing that I never envisioned, I think I, people always ask me, well, do you always, for a moment, do you don't wish you'd go back to medical school and do something else? Like, no, never. Never <laughs> crossed my mind. If I wouldn't know what a research professor does, or at that moment, I would have chosen to be a university professor since I was five years old, 10 years old. It's my dream. It's a place where you can travel the world. So here's a little guy again, can help. I saw him in China. He invited me to China. I was like, hey, it's Pablo. I was like, yeah. I'm having a birthday party. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah. I'm going to call it a symposium. But it's really a birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> really weird. Like, China, Senjin. I want to invite you. I was like, what are you talking about? That was kind of shady, right? He's like, yeah, I'll pay for everything. Just fly in and, and you got to give a talk. I was like, but I don't have a lot of stuff to, you to talk about. Like, it's 15 minutes. Talk about whatever you want. Oh, so, <laughs> so it's really a party. I mean, you have this, they give you tons of food, tons of drinks, and they make you eat and drink all the time, right? <laughs> and if it does, I guess it does disrespectful if you don't drink with them. And you don't want to, you always want to obey how, right? It's just a well-known figure in that. So we had a blast of going there. We went. The, the fortunate thing about this one is that I get to spend a lot of time with my family, so we can travel a lot. So now we're in the Great Wall of China. We went back to Mexico again. We went to Europe. All this is for part of the working, right? I'm working. I have to give a talk, but I take my family. I was like, well, the, the, the grants are paying for it, and the, the university wants me. They say that, they told me that one thing, the last time that we didn't give tenure to one professor, you know why it was? I was like, why? Because he didn't want to give talks. I was like, what? Like, yeah, he didn't want to travel. He was very afraid to travel, so he wanted to stay. Because he wrote a lot of grants. He got a lot of papers published. But he hated traveling the world. I love traveling the world. I'll go. And my wife's like, yeah, I'll go too. My daughter too, right? So that's, that's what we do. We get to spend a lot of time traveling. And there is work. I mean, I'm not going to say that everybody should become a research professor. There's a lot of work. You have to put the time right. You have to mentor students. You have to be patient with students. But there's a lot of good things that come to it. You have to always be thinking about how are you going to make new things, new ideas. So instead of, you're not going to have somebody that's telling you, can you do this or do that? You have to start thinking. Which project do I want my students to work on for the next five, six years? And you constantly have to be thinking about those things. Because you want them to be successful. And here we're celebrating every little thing. So here we're celebrating my first oh, paper from my group. Though. It was at Jax. And this paper at Jax is the, is the top journal in, in American Chemical Society. That's what it's called. So it's the top journal in the United States. And this one is the one that really got me, though, a grant. A grant to keep supporting my research. And we celebrated everything. And along the way, I even celebrated that time where, even in, in, in Professor Miller's class, when we got an A or a B, we celebrated. We're almost there for becoming a, a doctor. So we went out and went to party with my friends. We got a, a quiz and we got an A. It's like, hey, let's go party it up. I have 20 bucks. And you always do places like that. Well, for 20 bucks, you will not remember what happened. So we still 
party, but in a different way. And now I party with my family. <laughs> and yeah, that is my journey. So this, this is what I do as a professor. And I'll be happy to take any questions. And thank you all for, for your attention. found the solution and the problem, you gave her the paper the next day and told her this is the, the answer to your problem. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, that's, that's one of the reasons she kept you on. That's, that's the thing that I'll, she really pushed me and she's demanded a lot from me. 
And now I can see postdocs are really expensive, paying like eighty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so they're really expensive, and she demanded a lot. She's like, "Well, it's wild if you really want to." She came to me one day. He's like, "I never asked any of my postdocs this, but what do you want to do in the future?" Because nobody made it past that person. <laughs> so finally, she's like, "I got one that I could maybe invest some time." Like, I think I want to become a professor, and I was really afraid. He's like, a "Professor where? In, in a top ten program?" Top 50 program in a small school thing, but mm -hmm. I think in, in the top 50 will be good somewhere. Like so I researched, like, yeah, I was like, well, I want you to do this, this, and this, and this. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> and then, but she was really devoted to making me a professor. She's somebody that worked with my grants, that got me a lot of experience teaching, that mentoring students, and that I always in front of people that ask me, was well, so tell me what you think about this problem. How come we can't solve this? And I was always trying to be challenged. Like, well, I think we need to develop this new method. And how are you going to develop that method? So it made me think even more critically in front of everything. So she's somebody that really devoted a lot of time in. And I contributed a lot to her research group. She's uh, when I was there, we got an NIH grant, which is a huge deal for that, basically three million dollars. So for her, it was also an investment to make me a better scientist. So we both benefited. If anybody had any questions, would you be willing to stick around for a few minutes? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, let's thank Professor Gutierrez one more time.